Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to In Conservation with another episode. And I am David Lindo, and my guest today is a man that I've known throughout, in fact, beyond the beginning of my career, um, Stephen Moss. Um, he's well known to many, and he needs very little introduction, really. I mean, you know, he's a, <coughs> excuse me, one of um, Britain's leading nature writers who writes a book every five minutes he's probably just finishing off one now uh, knowing him um he's a broadcaster um he's also uh, has been a, a producer um for the bbc um just let me in some more people and um he, yeah and also now he's living in the somerset, somerset levels but he was originally a londoner in fact that's where i originally met him and maybe stephen by the way Good evening, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, David. A pleasure to be here, as always. Maybe, Stephen, you can recount that historic moment when we both, we first crossed paths, basically. Yeah, it was, I think it was 1993, and it was in Richmond Park. And what's nice is we both remember this, whereas I know a lot of people where I remember where I met them, or they remember where they met me, but we don't both remember. I was in my prime one time. We were, you were in your pram, you were very young, uh, I wasn't, and we were watching uh, the only autumn and bunting I've ever seen in Britain. And actually I've seen very few autumn and buntings anywhere. I've seen the odd one in France and the odd one in Israel. Um, and I've not seen one before or since, and we went to Twitch it and I bumped into you and I think I sort of knew who you were and I think you sort of knew who I was. Maybe not at that stage, actually. I don't think I'd done any writing by then, so... Uh, I think I knew you from your TV. Oh, I think, actually, I don't, I don't think I did know I you. We did. Yeah. I, don't th I think we were just both London birders at that point. Actually, I think it's that long ago. So, yeah, 27 years. So, um, and we've seen each other a lot since then. And we are good friends. And um, as I say, it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, I must say to everyone, um, when I first uh, was born as the urban birder, which is now 15, so I'm about 15 years old, um, Stephen's one of the first people that I contacted because I remember shortly after my inaugural uh, appearance on Spring Watch, I called Stephen for advice and he's basically been advising me ever since. And, and, and he also, my first book I wrote, he was, um, he was, uh, well, he wrote the forward for it, which was a very beautiful forward as well. I must thank you. So um, that was great. So I've got back... a kinship with you, David, because you're the urban birder and I was the suburban birder because I was brought up in a, you know, not too different from you. You were more, more urban. I was in the suburbs and then I became the rural birder. So I think I've got two and you've only got one because I'm now in <laughs> some <of that. coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this anyway because it's on your bio and people may need to know this or may not know this, should I say, but you have TV credits, including BAFTA award winning credits for Spring Watch, The Nature of Britain, Birds Britannia, um, and your books include Wild Hares. I mean, your books, I mean, you've probably got five just new ones just now, but um, Wild Hares and Hummingbirds, Wild Kingdom, uh, The Robin, I mean, I can go on. I mean, it's, it's just a hundred. I mean, how many books have you? Up until 10 minutes ago, how many books have you written? About 40, including co-written ones. I'm not including my forward of yours. That's in a separate pile. <laughs> I've got very expensive children, David. You know that. Yeah, true, true. Um, so that's, that's a lot of, uh, lot of writing. And so I'll be very keen um, later on to, to talk to you about your, your processes because, you know, I, 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 it's incredible. Your prolificness is it's incredible. So it must be... Uh, there must be some secret I'm sure people will be interested to hear. You um, also, uh, what did you do? You also authored National, the National Trust's 2012 Nat Natural Childhood Report. And that's uh, in connect, reconnect, about reconnecting children with nature. Sorry, I'm nodding here in the heat. Um, you write regularly for Birdwatch, um, The Guardian, of course, and you are the president of the Somerset Wildlife Trust. Um, and you teach uh, an MA in travel and nature writing at Bath Spa University. So that is a long uh, list of uh, stuff that you do in accolades. Where did it all begin, Stephen? Um, it all began, I've got a photo I'll show you when I do my little presentation, but it all began actually before that. Um, I can't remember 
not being into birds. And the reason is my late mother, who died quite a long time ago now, bless her, she used to tell me that she took me to feed the ducks when I was about three years old down at the River Thames, near where I lived in Shepparton. And I saw some funny black ducks and I asked her what they were. And given that she'd been evacuated to Devon in the war, I thought she might know, but she didn't. And she took me home and said, we've got a bird book and gave me the Observer Book of Birds. And they were coots, of course. And I spent, I just memorised that book. Luckily, that book's in black and white, because if it had been a kingfisher, I couldn't have looked it up. But the coots are in black and white anyway. So, um, yeah. so it started there and it's never stopped. You know, that was it. I've never, I, I can't imagine not being into birds. And, you know, you're very similar, aren't you? You started again. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I was watching an interview the other day where the person being interviewed claimed that <laughs> she started birding when she was four days old. Um, I, I, I kind of, you know, I can remember being four years old, five years old, um, and watching things flying around and reading, oh, what I, or should I say, looking at pictures in books. But uh, <laughs> that's quite funny. Anyway, um, Talking about books, I mean, did you actually, because for example, I, I was talking to someone else on one of these episodes and I produced um, something that I found in a box and it was actually the first book I ever wrote in my life um, on an exercise book uh, and it was called Unusual Tits. <laughs> you were 23. <laughs> um, and I was uh, about eight years old and basically it was about... Um, tips that I saw in books that I thought looked unusual so I wrote about them and drew them. Did you actually have, um, did you start writing a, at an early age like that? I, I did and funny enough I was thinking the other day I saw a read bunting and I have this, you must have this, you see a bird and you remember something from your childhood related to that bird and I remembered and I can't get this out of my head now that I drew a read bunting when I was 10, nine or ten years old and I've still got the drawing, I found it the other day and it's not a bad drawing for a nine-year-old of a male reed bunting with the words reed bunting underneath. Um, I've never done a drawing of a bird since in my whole life. Yeah. And it's that classic thing of, I was hopeless at art. I was so bad at art, they made me do woodwork at school. And I was really bad at that as well. Um, so, but writing always came naturally to me. I was always good at English at school. I was always, you know, I could pass exams. And at the age of 13, I had a really inspiring, very young teacher uh, called Jim Scouse, who encouraged me to do English and then got me later on editing the school magazine. And I loved writing and I loved, I loved words. My mother gave me that. My mother left school at 15. She was a single parent. She was brought up, her whole teenage years coincided with the war. So she had a really tough life. But she, one thing she absolutely drummed into me was books and words and reading are really important. She was a very intelligent woman who, who got, you know, obviously left school at 15 because that's what you did then. Um, and that was, you know, so words have always been there. My company that I run is called Birds and Words. And I think that sort of sums it up, really. They're, they're my two obsessions. Of course, you're, not, you're, you're half Italian, aren't you? I am after that. There is a whole other story here, uh, David. And funnily enough, the next book I might start is a memoir about my family, and it's called Four Funerals and a Wedding. Um, and it's to do with the fact my f I, I met my father when I was 42, and he was an Italian bus driver who seduced my mother on the last night of the holiday with my grandmother asleep in the same room, as he told me a few years ago, before he sadly then also died. But... Um, but yeah, so yeah, I have quite a bizarre background. And my mother had no interest in birds, but she drove me, bless her, until I was old enough to cycle around and go off on my own. She drove me, you know, we went on family holidays to places like the New Forest, you know, Dorset, Minsmere, because she knew I was into birds. So, you know, without that, I would never have got, you know, kept that interest. Yeah. Well, I guess your presentation kind of covers some of the stuff that I may be, may be asking. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what I've done is, I've done a presentation where I'll show you, it, it's, it's a little bit about me, which you've really covered now, so I'll whiz through that. And then a little bit about my television career, and I've got a nice clip to show. And then the rest of it is basically about nature writing. And obviously I teach this, and I've got, I've spent the last, I talked to Dominic Cousins <laughs> the other day, who you and I know, and many of uh, people here will know. And Dominic said, I'm really terrified about analysing my own writing. He said, if I did what you did and taught nature writing, it would stop me writing. 
because once you start looking at what you're doing you you start then becoming self-conscious and i said it's very funny it doesn't it, it it really helps your writing i think um so i'm going to talk a little bit about techniques and then obviously we can open it up to questions so probably probably 10 minutes the presentation if that you know so yeah cool we'll do that then i mean i just got a message here from viv who's one of the zoomers here she said her first book in terms of writing was about ben the flea who hitched the lift to travel the world on a swallow oh how lovely yeah it's well, that's interesting well i'll come to that in a minute <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, uh, by the way, before you actually do your presentation, has anyone got any early doors questions for Stephen that don't relate to him or his books? Thought not. Okay, Stephen, it's all you. It's all yours. Lovely. And by the way, hi, Sue. I've just seen you've joined. <laughs> um, right. So let me see if I can do this and share the screen. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, while okay. Stephen's okay. doing that, if you want to see the whole of his presentation as a whole screen, then you need to go to your actual um, top of your screen and click um, something. I think click it to make it just his um, screen big. Or maybe just click on his picture, I don't know. Maybe someone could write in chat as to what, what uh, you're supposed to do. Put it in speak of you. Right, all right. I think it's showing, right? So can you see me? We can see you. Me in a fancy shirt. Well, you've told everyone what I do. This is the, it's not the earliest photo I have of me. I can't find the earliest one. There is a photo of me wearing knickerbockers at the age of about 15 months, holding my hand out to a jackdaw that came to our garden and took food, which must have presumed have been an escape. But this is me in St. James's Park, a, the age of about eight or nine in the late sixties, feeding sparrows, a rare bird that some younger ones of you won't have seen. Um, and I'm very lucky because I've explained to you how I got into birds, but then many years later, I turned my hobby into my job, which means that over the years, uh, I was actually in my late, well, mid thirties when I started writing books on birds and then working in television. And so I have actually now watched and filmed and written about birds on all seven continents. This is me at O'Reilly's in Australia, feeding a regent bowbird. Um, sadly, I'm in focus and the bird isn't, but. I didn't take the photo. Um, it all began when I left university. I joined the BBC. I was very lucky. I'd gone to university and I'd, I'd um, managed to get a job at the Beeb. And one day they said, do you want to make a film um, it's for a medical programme about possibility of hearing loss from wearing a Sony Walkman? Um, older members of the audience may remember what a Sony Walkman is. David, you won't, but, um, and they said, we want to know about, you know, we want someone who can be a celebrity who we can test their hearing. Um, I said, well, Bill Oddie's very into music. And so, oh, yeah, he'd be good. And of course, the only reason I said that was I wanted to meet Bill because Bill, of course, I knew was a really good bird. He wasn't a celebrity birder. He was a hardcore proper birder who happened to be a celebrity. And um, I, chatted to him and he was unbelievably encouraging and helpful and when I left he said to me if I if you're ever a producer because I was a very junior researcher he said, if you're ever a producer and want to make a program about bird watching I'd love to present it and year after year I put this idea in and 13 years later because the BBC worked so quickly they um, accepted it and we ended up at Minsmere and then the following year we ended up on Shetland where this is on uh, the island of Nos filming puffins and I thought I ought to show you a clip and this is my absolute favourite of all Bill's clips of the many many series I did with him um, because you'll see two things here you'll see firstly what a genius Bill is when something goes wrong and he ad libs because he's like a jazz musician secondly you'll see how brilliantly our cameraman and our sound recorders managed to get close and we got close to the puffins but thirdly anyone under about 35 will be very baffled as to what goes wrong in this clip but Trust me, um, hopefully you'll get it. I have never been anywhere, and I mean this, even up in Shetland over the years, I've never ever got as close to puffins as this. Quite astonishing. I mean, people go on and on and on about puffins. You can understand why, but they come up with all sorts of images like their little, uh, little old gentlemen in dinner jackets waiting to go into supper, having a chat at the club. And it's true, they do look a bit like that. And uh, other people call them sea parrots. Um, 
the obvious reason, parrot-like beak. And yes, they, they, they've got wonderful shape, and they've got a funny mouth, and they've got funny faces, and they're cute as all can be. But I'll be honest, really, I think, in a sense, they speak for themselves. Squeak, squeak, that's the sound of my long lens being removed because these birds are so close, I can photograph them with a normal lens. And they just don't care. I can't tell you how exciting this is. Because, <laughs> well, I feel something. I've been birding an awful long time, and I've seen an awful lot of puppets, but I've never, ever been anything like as close as this to one. Now turn this way. Thank you. And nice profile. And click. Oh. Normally I'd panic now because I've just come to the end of a roll of film. And I think, ah, they're going to go. By the time I've got the new film in, they won't be here. But I don't think that's going to happen somewhere. It's got to change role. Okay. Now, what I absolutely love about that is is Bill's amazing ability to ad lib and the fact my mother used to say to me, well, what does a TV producer actually do? And the answer sometimes is absolutely nothing. My job was to get Bill by a puffin on Shetland with very good cameraman, a very good sound recordist and then a brilliant editor called Ed, which was helpful, who used to be the lead guitarist in The Vapours. Um, and Ed cut that together very beautifully but what was brilliant was at the moment when the camera runs out of film for that is what has happened for you younger viewers um sorry that sounds terribly patronizing i know you know exactly what it is but basically when the camera ran out of film bill continues to ad lib and none of us stop because we'd learned with bill you never stop until he says stop and sometimes he'd go off on one and it was total nonsense like a jazz musician but sometimes it was absolutely brilliant um Anyway, I left the BBC almost a decade ago now, and I did a little bit more telly, but by then I was doing a lot of writing. And I became, on the, more or less my last day at the BBC, my friend Tim Schoons, who took over from me on Springwatch, caught me in the canteen while one of our colleagues, um, one of the finance uh, people, she'd seen a bird in her garden and she described it to me and she said, I think it's a bullfinch. And it was, it wasn't a japinch, it was a bullfinch. And I was very pleased for her and I looked very pleased. and and. Tim said to me, he said afterwards, he said, I thought you were going to hold out your hands and put your hands on her head and in a loud, booming American voice say, have you heard the good news about nature? And I said, you know what, Tim, you've made me realise what I actually do in life, my purpose in life, because I was about to leave the BBC, a big career, you know, about to stop making television programmes. Was that going to, was that going to mean, I felt like a lot of people do when they leave a, a job that they've done for most of their life, was it going to make me feel, um, perhaps I didn't have a purpose in life. And then I said, no, actually everything I do, whether it's TV or books or talks or this or teaching, I'm an evangelist to nature. That's my job. And I love this photo. I've sent this after my book, The Robin came out. I was sent this by a guy who'd got a tame Robin who'd come into his house and perched on the book. And I just adore this. Um, because like everyone here, I adore nature. I find birds and the rest of nature not just fascinating, it, it, it's, it's central to my life. Uh, in the way that, for some of you, it may, this may also be the case, that religion or music or sport or art can be central to your life. It's, it's incredibly important to me and David and I'm sure the rest of you. Um, and I so, I've written a number of books and I'll go through a few of them now, just two or three. The Robin I wrote because of David's brilliant poll. He did that amazing poll. Uh, he, he tried to fiddle the vote at the end because he actually went, came out and talked about blackbirds uh, being so wonderful. Um, I won't tell David, because obviously you can't hear this, that I hate blackbirds. I find them deeply, deeply dull. I hate the song. I don't hate them as birds, they're fine. But uh, I got hissed when I said that in a bookshop recently. Um, but uh, I've also got a son outside squeaking a toy at our dog. But we'll forget that never mind it's very i've got eight people i'm self-isolating with it's mad um so the robin of biography came out of that and and i wanted to bring together the two things that fascinate me about birds that I, I call them their double life the one side of their life is the scientific side the behavior what birds do what robins do which is really interesting and the second side of it is what robins mean to us 
Robins have this extraordinary, like other birds, like the skylark and the nightingale, and later the wren I wrote about, they have this cultural life that is entirely to do with our view about them. The robin is just one of 300 members of its family, and some of the others are quite well known. The red start, the, the, the wheat ear, the stone chat, the spotted flycatcher, but because um, they do keep moving them around. I think they're all in the same family still. Um, but the robin stands out because of what it means to us. The robin doesn't know that. Robin doesn't give a toss what we think of it. Um, but it's still central to what the robin is, and that's what these books are. And I'm very pleased to say that lots and lots of people bought this book, about 40,000 people bought it, and uh, it got translated into Chinese and Dutch. And so that I then did the wren, and I'll talk in a minute about the other ones I'm doing. But in recent years, I've got more and more angry about the way um, the environment is going, as most of us have. And I know Dave has written very passionately about this as well. So I've started writing, um, oh, right, hang on. That's strange, it's not going to the next one. Why not? Give me a minute. Oh yes it is, right. Uh, I've started writing more polemical books, books with a message. And this was a, this was a book that I think was quite well balanced. Um, I dedicated it to David and my dear friend, Derek Moore, who sadly died while I was writing it, who was an amazing mentor of mine, Frontal Influence. Derek, I think would have found the book, he would have said, you've gone too easy on people. Cause I wrote about farming and woodland management and all the different habitats in Britain and what we're trying to do to bring back Britain's wildlife. Um, but I probably let, some of the culprits off the hook a bit. Um, I then this year wrote this book, The Accidental Countryside, which is even more polemical. And it's about all those funny little places that we, very much the places David and I grew up bird watching around, you know, edges of parks, railway cuttings, wormwood scrubs, uh, Shepton gravel pits, you know, places that were entirely built without nature in mind. And yet we have moved in and we have uh, nature has moved in and we have suddenly realised that these are the places where most of nature lives. The Shard, you know, peregrines in London, um, gravel pits, old peat diggings on the Somerset levels, uh, roadside verges, golf courses, places that, frankly, if the countryside was any good, nature wouldn't have to live in these places. But it does because the countryside is not good. Um, and I think what's interesting about teaching the course at Bath Spa that I do, which incidentally you can live anywhere in the world and do, um, it's a, what we call a low residency course. Um, what I've realised is that we need to have a message when we write about nature. Now that message can be very overt. The Accidental Countryside is quite a polemical book. I wouldn't say it's an angry book, but it's got bits in where I make it very clear how I feel about the way the countryside is managed. This book is the next one in the series, The Swallow, a biography. It's the third one I'll be doing. Uh, and I finished it. It went off last week. This is the cover. And in The Swallow, I realised as I was writing it that because unlike the wren and the robin, the swallow is this extraordinary global traveller. Of course, it sums up two things. It sums up the danger that nature faces through climate, the climate crisis and all the different issues of habitat loss because it lives in so many places. But what was really special for me when I went to um, South Africa in January to see three million swallows at their roost and I talked to people there and I said oh this is where swallows come to spend the winter and they looked at me a little bit puzzled and they said no they don't they come here to spend the summer. I was like, of course they do. This is a bird that never sees winter. It, it leaves us in autumn and it arrives in South Africa a few weeks later in spring and then comes back to us in spring. And the book is a, it has a message of hope in it, but it has quite a sharp message about the fact that the swallow is, I believe, and this is from a wonderful man called Collingwood Ingram, who wrote in the 70s. And he said, the swallow is without, writers then had this way of writing. He said, the swallow is without question, without question, the best known and the best loved bird in the world. And I thought, mm, no, come on, robins are better loved than swallows. And I thought, ah, oh, but only in Britain. He's absolutely spot on. The swallow is quite clearly, the barn swallow, as we call it officially, is without question a bird that is known in almost every country. He's one of only three species that's ever been seen in all, three, all seven continents. So it's an extraordinary bird. And this is very timely because 
This current crisis that we're living through is making us all turn to nature. Now, those of us who are passionate about nature, which I'm sure you all are, I don't think anyone's turned up by accident, um, all of you who are very passionate about nature know that nature is very important for our lives, as I said earlier, and it makes us, that's why I want to convert everyone to nature. But the difference is that this year, all the people who don't really get nature have been saying to me, God, aren't the birds singing loudly? I heard a cuckoo. Are, are they singing louder than they usually do? And you say, no, no, um, three things. No aircraft or traffic, um, very nice weather, and you're listening because you're not running around like a lunatic all the time. And of course, that's, that's how it's happened. If you'll excuse me just for a moment. Guys, could you just be a tiny bit quieter? Thank you. They're playing table tennis. Um, this isn't just the children, this is adults as well. So I wrote the swallow, uh, as I say, for that, and it seemed very timely when I was finishing it. But more timely, I wrote a piece for the Guardian, which you can look up. Which they they lifted this quote. I was quite proud of this when I when I read read it again when it was in print. Birdsong has risen like a tide of hope from our silent cities. Is it here to stay? And what I was saying, well, what I was using birdsong was a metaphor there. That that as someone said to me the other day, well, Chris Packham. Actually, I was talking to Chris Packham about Springwatch, and he said, um, "We've suddenly." made people realise in their millions that nature is important and they've noticed it on their doorstep where they live because they've had to and of course it's always been in cities as David knows what we've got to do is keep them we mustn't let them go back to forgetting how they felt when they woke up at four in the morning and heard birdsong when they went on their daily exercise walk and heard birdsong or saw birds um, so that's very very important and what has been lovely is I've been following tweets of course I've gone mad on Twitter recently um, and many of the tweets from people all over the world and International Dawn Chorus Day was a good example set up by my dear old friend Chris Baines many years ago people from Sean Dooley in Australia who I'm sure David knows you know Frankie Zaguri in, in and Wendy um, Clark in the States, uh, Marek Bukowski in Poland. They're either tweeting or Marek sending wonderful emails about all the birds around him, the black woodpeckers and the capercaillie and you know, whatever. And we're starting, to, everyone is focusing on nature and their doorstep and that's what we're all doing. So what I'm gonna do now is, this is a bit of an experiment. I'm gonna show you a video that my son who's with us and who is a filmmaker did using a drone. And it's about two minutes long and it shows our garden and my patch. My patch used to be, I have patches all over the place, but my typical patches are about five miles away. They're either a long cycle or a short drive away. Um, this one isn't. It starts at the end of my road and it goes for three miles round this rather unprepossessing little chunk of farmland on the Somerset levels, uh, in which I have seen 69 species of bird in the last, well, since January. So I'm going to just what I'm going to try to do is talk through, and this is a bit of an experiment, how I write when I go out on this patch. So let's start here. So there's Rosie in the garden, and it's our lovely Labrador. And yes, we're very lucky, we've got a big garden, and there's the Mendip Hills. And then as we move forward, you'll see some lanes, and it forms a circuit. That's a little hamlet there called Perry after pear cider. There's a lot of history in this area. I'm always fascinated when I write about the history of a place. And you can see that road going ahead in front of you and that road stretches off. And I go around here once or twice a day, either on my bike or with Rosie, the dog, and I often record stuff on my phone. I don't always, I sometimes just go around. But when I feel inspired, I start to um, record things. And that's the most important starting point. You have to write before you write, you have to experience. You have to go out in nature and experience in it. Then you have to keep notes, take a nature diary. Then you have to go home, as I'm doing now. Imagine I've done this three mile circuit around to the right there, you can see it. Um, it is just fields and a few reams, these ditches we get in Somerset and the hills in the background. And then I come back home and I sit in my little office, which you might see where I am now. Gosh, how weird. Yes, hang on. It go for, yes, there's the greenhouse. Come on, bottom right hand corner. No, you can't see it. I'm just below the screen there. And 
that's where I sit and I reflect on what I've done. And then I turn it, the fourth stage is I turn it into something more permanent. I found this wonderful quote from Sandy Toxvig the other day. She said, I love the thing of subduing words. My dad was a wonderful writer. He used to describe it as first you catch your fish, then you need to fillet your fish until you serve the finest piece. And I love that notion that writing, first you have to catch your fish and then you have to fillet it in the writing to find that piece. Um, and lockdown started here on the first day of spring. And that weekend, it was Suzanne's birthday, my wife, and we went for a walk on the Sunday before lockdown. And I started keeping a little nature diary then. I always take notes, but I started actually writing it as a diary. And that has turned into this. This is a wonderful Carrie Aykroyd picture, which sums up where I live um, in a sort of rather romantic way. And I am, David joked that, he said, what book have you written in the last five minutes? Well, I wasn't meant to write a book now. I, I was stopping. I finished The Swallow and I was doing some other stuff. And I start on the swan, which is the next one in the series, but I'm not starting that till the summer. So I thought, I've got three months. I thought, what could I do in three months? I know, I'll write another book. So this book is going to be called Skylarks with Rosie. Um, and it's a lockdown nature diary. And it is a summary, not just of my experience, but of lots of other people, including David. I haven't told him yet, but he'll be in it. Marek, people all over the world, people who are tweeting me, people who are writing pieces about what they're experiencing. It's mostly my experience, of course, but it does include this. So um, that is the end of my presentation. And if I can, I will stop sharing and I will come back. Very expertly done. Thank there you very much. Very, 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 thank you very much for that. That uh, overhead um, uh, drone shot of your garden reminded me of the few goals I scored in that little goal against yeah. George, your son. Yeah, George always says to me, the kids used to say, David came down when he was, when George and Daisy were about three and Charlie was about four. And you haven't been Sid, so I keep inviting you. Um, and he, George used to say afterwards, when I mentioned David, he'd say, is that my brother, David? Because his much older brother, who's the filmmaker, is here, or is it football, David? So David, this David was always football, David, which I love. And you're still football, David. I mentioned you tonight and they went, oh, yeah, football, David. Um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, it does remind you, it's changed a bit since then, it's got more overgrown. <laughs> so, it's interesting talking about writing. One of the things that I have always thought about is how, how do you encourage people to find their own voice? Oh, that's a very good question. What we do on our course, and what I do if I do, I do day courses, I'm actually doing one in a couple of weeks with Hawkwood College, a, a three, an online so three week, an hour a week course. The first thing you do is say, don't get self-conscious go out and just write stuff so we sometimes give people a task we say you know write a, go for a walk and just write or, or write a piece that's entirely about sounds you know you're not allowed to make, use any description you can use any sense other than sight to describe so you know we set exercises but what happens amazingly david is people go and write something and then they on our course they then post it on a virtual blackboard and we critique it after about three or four of those if i read one of these pieces and if you didn't tell me which student had written it i, I could tell you i can normally tell you and it's something about because their voice is there and if they're good writers and they we always tell them to read it out loud when you've written something read it out loud don't edit it as you go that's fatal you know write it leave it 24 hours to settle, read it the next morning out loud, then edit it because you will notice things that, you know, words you've used, it's a bit waffly, you know, maybe you've started in the wrong place and then read it out loud again. And when you're happy with it, you send it off. And if you do that, you'll hear your voice. I hear your voice in your writing. When I read your proofs of your book originally, I was like, yeah, that's my friend David. You know, it, it's, it's strange. I think the fatal thing, you can be inspired by other writers, and we all have been, but don't try to copy them. I've read something recently written by a guy who copies J.A. Baker, who wrote The Peregrine, which I personally think, I always describe The Peregrine, is you know we like a mixed diet. Imagine someone's given you a massive box of the best possible Swiss chocolates, you know, just beautiful chocolates, but you have to eat them all in one go. That's what the peregrine's like. You read one passage from the peregrine and it's like, oh, that's wonderful. You read the next one, you think, oh, it's a bit the same. You read four or five and you're like, right, I'm full now. 
I'm stuffed. I want some, I want a nice, you know, bit of Marmite on toast or something. I want something different. And this guy had written a book entirely in the style of the Peregrine and that, you know, that he'd almost copied that. And that is fatal, you know. Yeah, because that book's quite polarising because some people absolutely adore it. Yeah, most people absolutely adore it. And I think it's ruined nature writing. I think a huge number of people adore it so much that they, they it's, it's deeply humorless. He made most of it up. You can argue that's okay because he, he, it's almost a poem, you know. Poets make stuff up, so that's fine. But it, it's, I just find it very, very hard going. Um, but I am in a, you know, people like Mark Cocker, Robert McFarlane, all of whom I admire hugely and are much better known nature writers than me, love it. But I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, nature writing, especially when I first came across it, always felt it was kind of stereotypically twee. Um, I, I always felt you had to write about the, the willows whispering in the wind and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I was, do you still see that when you, um, when you first, you know, you, your students first come to you and their first attempts, are they very sort of in that mould? Um, some of them are. Sometimes the stuff they send in when they apply is a bit like that because they've tried really hard and they've spent ages doing it with the application. What then happens on our first week, we send them out for an hour. We say, right, you've got an hour. You come back, you've now got an hour to write it. Then they produce really good stuff. They haven't got time to do all that poncy stuff. It's really interesting. They, I mean, without exception, that first writing is almost always this stuff in it that you think, wow, that's great. I wish I could write like that, you know. Um, but you're right. It's it's the one problem with nature writing is it can be, and it has been in the past, particularly before the Second World War, and the danger of doing it now, it becomes very reactionary. It becomes very, you know, wasn't the world wonderful before we ruined it? And that can have lots of issues about, um, it, 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 it's too strong to call it, you know, someone wrote a piece recently for a website saying, you know, is nature writing fascist? And it's like, come on, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not suggesting that we should, you know, do away with democracy and, and kill, you know, other races. But there is an element of nature writing that can be very reactionary, conservative, um, old fashioned. I think that's changed a lot, partly because new voices are coming in, you know, different ethnicities, different uh, ages, a lot of young writers, you know, Dara um, McAnulty, he's 16, and he's having his first book read on Radio 4 this week, you know. So there are new voices. The danger is if those new voices try to imitate a sort of perfect style. And what Mark Cocker wrote a few years ago, he, he had, and Robert Ravallo had this massive row in the pages of the New Statesman about this. R Mark basically said, look, nature writing isn't nature writing unless it addresses the crisis that nature is facing. Now, I agree, but I think you can address that crisis very subtly. When I wrote The Robin and the Wren, there's not an awful lot about the fact that they're in terrible trouble, because as you know, they're not. They're the second and first communist birds in Britain. It's partly why I write about them. I admire them so much. The swallow's different. Swallows are, you know, they're doing very well at the moment, but they might not, you know. So my book on the swallow has a lot more about climate crisis. It has a lot more about habitat loss. About persecution in some parts of the world of swallows um, uh, and so that's the danger that the, yes that nature writing can become twee and if it does it'll go the way that traditional travel writing went travel writing used to be rich mostly male not all uh, westerners going off to developing world countries and writing about them in a sort of you know I'm with these funny foreign people type approach now I'm, I'm being a bit rude for some many very fine travel writers but travel writing got a bit um it, it 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 started to believe its own publicity and it disappeared quite quickly and new travel writers have uh, arrived who are much more irreverent and do things like write a book about walking around the m25 which is much more real you know so i think i think there is a danger with nature writing that if we're not careful particularly as publishers keep saying oh we want another book like that one we want another H's for Hawk. Well, H's for Hawk's a great book, but if you then write a not very good version of it, it won't be a very good book, you know. So I think that that is that. Do you think you need to be an expert to be a nature writer? Oh, that's a very good question. I think you don't need to be. I think Patrick Barkham is a very good example. Patrick was a 30-year-old metropolitan London journalist, brought up in Norfolk. His dad used to run the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. 
chairman. So Patrick, as a child, knew a bit about nature, particularly butterflies. But when he set out to write the butterfly hours, he says at the beginning, look, I've forgotten almost everything. You know, of course I can identify most of the common species and a few of the slightly scarcer ones. But he said, I, I, I would have no idea how to find a brown hair streak, or whatever. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and find people who do. So he went on a quest and he, a lot of that book's about the people who are equally obsessed with butterflies. And what that book's about is Patrick regaining his passion for nature. So I think it's very good because it's a very honest book. Um, I sometimes admit that I, in my books I know absolutely nothing about plants. I took Brett Westwood around in my book Wild Hairs and Hummingbirds for a cycle ride around my parish because I said, well, I don't have a clue what any of these plants are except cow parsley. <laughs> you know, and he was great because he showed me. But, you know, I, I can turn that into a funny piece of, not funny, but, you know, a mildly amusing piece of writing if you're honest. I think what annoys me is when people try to write something and try to pretend they are an expert and they're not and you can tell <laughs> yes i must say brett westwood is a, a completely amazing naturalist and uh, you probably find him more often on radio don't you radio four don't yeah you? You do a lot of radio yeah i mean I, I i wrote this book wonderland with brett and i always say to people i'm tweeting it every day at the moment i'm tweeting extra and i put in brackets who wrote each one but it's very easy the one on black turn is me the one on empid flies is Brett. I don't know what a bloody empid, what's a bloody empid fly? You know, I was looking through the book thinking, lemon slug, you know, land caddis. I mean, he's just extraordinary. You know, he's an amazing man, a, a lovely man as well. And Maya has a question, Maya Bambrick. Hello, Maya. Um, Hi, Maya. I'm aiming to write a book very soon about my experience in, experiences with birding over the year as a young person. Um, do you have any advice on finding a publisher? Oh, that's a very good question. It's, it's something we talk about a lot on our course. Often, if your first book you do through a publisher without an agent, it's quite hard to get an agent unless you've written a book. Agents are quite picky. Not always the case. There are always exceptions. Having an agent is good in that they can help you, they guide you, they act as an intermediary between you and a publisher. So what I would say is for a first book, perhaps try to find a small publisher that will support you and give you more attention because you know, Dara went with Little Toller. Little Toller are a fantastic publisher, but they get very little publicity. They're not terribly well known. They produce beautiful books. That's the first thing. Look at the books. If they're, if they're cheap paper and look crap, don't go with that publisher. If the cover designs are rubbish, don't go with them. Little Toller books are lovely. So Dara went with Little Toller. Um, and that book, you know, will get it. Will, it's being noticed already. Um, so Little Toller are a good one. There are others. Uh, Elliot and Thompson are a small independent publisher who do nature. Then there's people like Bloomsbury, where people um like uh jim and um god what's his name jim uh, mm -hmm. uh julie bailey you know they are very sympathetic they they know about birds and wildlife and they produce some very good books as well um and you can approach a publisher but you need a treatment and treatments are quite tricky the other thing Ma, is don't try to put everything you've ever wanted to write in a book into the book that's absolutely fatal because A, it will be a mess, because it will, it will be everything you've always been interested in, and B, it doesn't leave you anything to write for your second book. And that, that's quite important that, you know, a book should be finite. <laughs> and the key thing, the most important piece of advice I've ever been given, and I, as Sue knows, because she's on my course, I, I go on and on about this. My dear friend Graham Costa, who's also my editor, talks about the story of the story. It's actually a phrase from the novelist Henry James. And for example, David's book, The Urban Birder, what's it about? It's about being an urban birder and it's about your life as an urban birder. What's it really about? It's about being an outsider in a world that where you don't look like all the other birders and how you get through that it's it's not a you know it's not a whinging story at all it's completely the opposite you, you know you don't do that my book about the swallow is about the life cycle of the swallow and how important they are culturally but it's also about the threats that all migratory birds face through climate change you know um h is for hawk is ostensibly about training a goshawk 
it's not about training a gossip at all. It's about dealing with or not dealing with grief of the, her father's death. And that, that comes up in the book, but it's not always obvious from the beginning. You start reading H. the Hawk, it looks like it's a book about gossips. Because of course it is a book about gossips, or about one gossip. Um, so that's quite an important element of writing, that, you, that a book is more than meets the eye. And you don't necessarily, so Dara's book is of course a diary of a young naturalist. It literally says that. But what it's really about, and of course he's very overt about this, it's about what it's like growing up as an autistic kid in Northern Ireland. And, and as an autistic kid anywhere, really. And, and nature being a haven for him when he was, when he couldn't cope. So yeah, that's a very obvious what's the story of the story. But that's what books need to be. Sorry, that's a very long answer. So for someone like Maya, who's writing a book, how, how she should go about it, because obviously she's probably, I, I don't know if you want to speak, Maya, I'm speaking on your behalf now, but she might be totally isolated thinking, you know what, I'm going to write a book because I've seen Dara do one, I've seen other yeah. people do books, I've read a few and I like them. How does she, that's the thing, how do you start? How do you know when you've finished? Who do you give it to before you give it to a publisher or, or try and give it to a publisher because yeah. that's, that's not easy yeah um, so how do you how do you quality control it because I know people who've written books um, and edited their own book and then they pass it over to you as a finished book yeah and it's dreadful you know there's, yeah. there's telling the spelling mistakes the story goes round in round in circles sometimes it's all a bit too kind of much how do you how do you go yeah. there? That's a lot of very good questions. I mean, storytelling is the absolute key. And storytelling does not necessarily mean beginning, middle and end in that order. You know, you start with an amazing incident in your life. If you're writing a memoir, you do not start with, I was born here and I did this, my parents did that. You know, that's really boring. You have that in there, of course you do, but you don't have it right at the beginning. You might start now and then look back, or you might, usually you start somewhere in the middle and then do that. So there's, there's different elements. The other thing, when I first wrote, I mean, I, writing, it's hard for me. The first 11 books I wrote were not anything like the books I write now. They, were, they actually sold very well because they were attracting birds to your garden, birds and weather. They were basically textbooks aimed at either birders in the case of birds and weather or ordinary householders in the case of attracting birds in your garden, which is why it sold 100,000 copies. Um, and those books taught me how to write in that I had to convey information and I had to write about the greenfinch but it, they're not very poetic you know they're, they're how to build an xbox they're what what foods to choose so I learned to write doing those books and then I sort of branched out and wrote books that even like birds and weather I would describe an amazing storm that seabirds turned up so I started getting a bit more literary is not the right word I suppose trying to entertain and engage the reader rather than just tell them something. So I started doing that and, you know, and I was writing articles at the time that did that as well. So one of the problems with writing a book before you've written much else is that you're probably not that used to writing. And, and you know, so write a lot. My son, when he became a filmmaker, John Aitchison, the cameraman said to him when David was 16, said, make a lot of films, go and make a lot of films then you'll get better at making films. Then decide what films you want to make. So with writing, it's write a lot of, you know, write nature diaries, write blogs, write articles, write anything. It doesn't always, it could be fiction, you know, write something, just be inspired and write it. And then say, okay, what do I want to write a book? And you may well have been doing this, Mark, sorry, I haven't uh, asked you, but you know, um, and then think about the book and think very hard about what's it really about and what's, where are its borders and what, what is the structure of the book? So when I wrote The Robin, it's January to December because that works for The Swallow, it's seasonal because, you know, spring, summer, autumn, winter. They're very easy structures, but they do mean that when I'm writing about swallows in Africa, I'm not putting it in the summer section, I'm putting it in the winter chapter. Okay. Is it a memoir you're trying to write, Maya? Hello. <laughs> very noisy um, road at the end of my garden, so you might not be able to hear me. Um, so I was thinking of like structuring it in sort of seasons and then sort of talking about my experiences over the years because I've written a blog before. Right. I used to write a blog and I've done articles um, and things like that and guest blogs and things. Um, sort of about my experiences with birding and 
uh, over the years and like the connections I've made with people and how it's helped me deal with anxiety and uh, things like that really. Yeah, I've seen on your tweets that sort of thing. Yeah. That's interesting because now you've got an angle. So your angle is, and this is where it gets difficult when you're writing very personally and Dara's very brave to write the book he's written. Mm. Um, and David, in his book, deals with elements of racism and people say, well, you can't be a bird watcher, that's what white people do, and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, if you have an angle, I would say use it, because mm. what, what that does is make you different. When we talk to our students about writing a book, we say there are three questions you need to ask about this book. Why this? Why me? Why now? So the why this, and I'll give you an example. My colleague, Gail, I'm going to use this because it's such a good example. Uh, my colleague Gail wrote this book last year. It's called The Country of Larks. And then when you read, it has two subtitles, quite interesting. It says A Chiltern Journey. So it looks like a lovely bucolic pastoral book, the sort of book that David was talking about, you know, a bit, a bit conservative, a bit romantic, whatever. And she follows in the footsteps of Robert Louis Stevenson. And the story is Robert Louis Stevenson, the author in the late 18th, 19th century, when he was a young man, took this walk through the Chilterns. And Gail follows in his footsteps. That's nice. Still a bit boring though, isn't it, frankly? Um, why her? Because she's brought up in the Chilterns. Except she's never really been her home because she didn't move there till she was 12 because her dad was in the army. So it's where she regards as home, but she has ambivalent views of it because it's quite a conservative, slightly dull place. The killer line is on the front page. In the footsteps of Robert Louis Stevenson and the footprint of HS2. Because the route that Stevenson walked and that Gale followed is where they're going to build the high-speed rail link, HS2. So suddenly she had a book. Without that, as she said the other day, it's an interesting article, probably for a walking magazine, isn't it? You know, I followed in the footsteps of Robert Louis Stevenson. Lovely, that's very nice, so what? Instead of which, it's a brilliant book because she has that. So if you've got an element which other people share, the whole anxiety thing, which a lot of people have at the moment, you know, I have people in my own family who have this issue, then they might want to read that. Whereas if you just write about, you know, the wildlife you see, they might not. The danger with writing any book is that well, there's a couple of dangers. One is you're probably writing about quite personal issues. Even in my lockdown nature diary, there are things that have happened in the last three months, like my parents-in-law have become ill, they're very elderly, and I don't know whether to put that in because it's relevant because I'm here. It's not, it's not core to the book, but my wife's quite a private person. She might think, hmm, I actually, I don't really want that in it. I, I would absolutely respect that. And you might feel that if you say certain things in your book, you know, your family members or your friends might not be happy with that, or you might not be in the future. You are of the generation who, of course, puts their whole lives online, so it's a bit different. You know? But just bear that in mind, you know, that, that is a, a, a thing. And I think the other issue is that some people, there's a really fine balance between writing about nature, which the traditional nature writers used to do, which as David said, can be a bit dull. It can be a bit, you get to the end of a book and you think well, that was lovely, so what? Because really there isn't much more. On the other hand, a lot of people are reacting against the confessional type of nature memoir, or travel memoir, because they're saying, you know, like Cheryl Strayed's Wild or like Eat, Pray, Love, they're saying, oh, come on, you're just being self-indulgent. You know, lots of people suffer from whatever you've you know, condition you have, whether it's physical or mental health or emotional health, you know, you're using nature as a sort of, not as a crutch in your lives, but you know, you're using nature, you're writing about nature because it's, it's fashionable to write about it. Now, I think that's unfair, but it's something to bear in mind that what you must make sure is the book doesn't become self-indulgent. The reason Nature's for Hawk is so good is she's very restrained at actually describing how upset she is when her father dies. You know she is absolutely devastated but she, don't, she never actually says so. You know what it isn't is a sort of oh my god you know woe is me it was so terrible you know. So of course that means bringing in humour. There's quite a lot of humour in that book actually quite subtle. Salt Par, the book Raina Wynn's book about you know her husband being diagnosed with a, a potentially fatal disease and then losing their home on the same day and they walk around the southwest coastal path with no money and it's very funny. It's a funny book. I mean they're in this terrible situation 
but it's got humor in not lots but you know it, it's again it's about doing that so i think think of all those things i'm very happy if you want to uh, dm me or whatever contact me you can contact me through david you know and um we can have a chat about it later because obviously it's it's quite specific mm, thank you. you yeah but it's you know it's, really it's interesting it's it's you know i know you know again sometimes it's good to write a book and i know gail feels this she feels this was a, a book she could manage it's quite a short book she's very good writer a very experienced writer um travel writer but she'd never written a book before and this book has led her getting a very good commission with a big publisher to write a second book which is about a pilgrimage walk and is much more ambitious it's about the state of britain today and she's really glad she wrote the first book which is less it's a brilliant book but it it, it its scope is quite clear you know it's the walk and hs2 and the people she meets and Robert Louis Stevenson so she can't like go off on in fact she said to me she said I put a lot of my childhood into the book and the editor said take it out it's not it's not this book you know but so you know again always be clear what you're writing about and why good um anyone else in the zooming room that would like to ask Stephen a question they've all gone quiet yeah, um, yeah, uh, let's see now. Uh, I've got a couple. Okay, thank you, Claire. <laughs> uh, do you have a writing discipline, Stephen? Do you sort of write nine to five or you just write as and when? I know some writers do, they treat it like a job, so they sort of start, have a start time and a finish time. And you do. Yeah, it, it is a job um i mean that's really important i i write for money i write for lots of other reasons but i write when i'm commissioned funnily enough the skylarks with rosie i haven't been commissioned yet i hope i will but you know normally i've been commissioned to write a book so i have to write it um so i write it i don't because i have a very complicated um life it's got easier with lockdown of course because i'm here every day um but i normally try to write in the morning and I very rarely write for more than about four hours. And that's with the odd break as well. Um, you know, I might write from eight in the morning till lunchtime with a couple of short breaks, say four hours. I don't believe you, you know, if you, I, I'm a morning person also, if you carry on writing, I think it gets less good. And then often I leave it to the next morning. And sometimes if I'm in the middle of a book, I'll, I'll start by reading through the chapter, you know, the whole of the chapter that perhaps it's taken me Say I've written half a chapter and it's taken me a few days, perhaps not consecutively, because I'm I'm not I am disciplined, but I have lots of other things to, to get in the way and, and work to do and students to teach and everything. Um I'll often then sit down one day and read through it all, and then after an hour of just tweaking it and just making a few changes, I'll then write the next bits because I've I, it's like I've got myself into it. Um and that for me works. Other writers write, you know, they start at seven at night and they stay up till one in the morning. But I could never do that. The, the discipline, I sometimes go off when I'm finishing a book. And I did this with the Robin and the Wren and Mrs. Moreau's Warbler. I went and stayed with my friends, Kevin and Donna Cox down in Devon. They've got a cottage in their very large grounds. And I just hid myself away. I meant to do it for a week. I actually, I did it for four days because I missed my kids. Um, but in four days, I... I wrote half the rent more or less in four days because I got all the research done and I just went and did it. And I, I checked my emails first thing in the morning and then later in the day, you know, I was, when I'm here, I tend to fiddle and, Oh, I'll just check the email. And that's fatal. I shouldn't do that. I should, you know, I should like turn the internet off. Yeah, it's interesting, Stephen, because I read an article in the Guardian a few years ago and they interviewed some really top notch um, writers who've written novels and stuff to ask them about their working schedule. And all of them said, you know, on paper, it was all about getting up in the morning, sending the kids off to school, coming back, sitting down, working till lunchtime, having lunch, and then working until they pick the kids up in the evening, in the afternoon. And invariably, they drop the kids off to school, come back, have breakfast, faff around looking on Facebook and Twitter and looking at emails, and they don't start work till one in the afternoon, and before they know it, they have to go and get the kids again. Yeah. So it's very hard to have that discipline, isn't it? Yeah, I'm much more disciplined than that with all my work. I always have been. I, I, when I'm working, I'm working. I mean, I stop. You know, I always stop at 11. We have buzzard o'clock now. At 11 o'clock, I go out and Suzanne joins me and we sit on, in our garden and look up and the buzzards 
come and this year the peregrine the red kite the marsh area <laughs> we've had them all but you know so i i do do that um and i but i'm definitely a morning person but sometimes it's only an hour that's enough you know yeah well i must say despite the short hours you work you are very prolific i must say <laughs> anyone I mean, else claire. i think claire had a second one. Oh, sorry well, I've, 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 I've got claire. several actually but i might save some till a bit later i was to the point that you just mentioned about doing research do you spend a lot of time researching getting everything ready and then you think right now's the time to write so everything's there which think, is, yeah sort of, um, might make with, it easier with the bird biographies and i learned this doing the robin and of course therefore when i wrote the wren and the swallow it was easier the first thing I do, and this works really well, is I get, I've got a lot of very old bird books, starting with Gilbert White and working on. And I go and get them out of my shelf and I look through them and I look up the robin in them or the swallow, or whatever I'm doing. It's very easy for the species. And I put little stickers in where they are. And then when I've got done, got a pile of that many books, I sit down and I actually type up the quotes I'm going to use in the book because I in my those books I quote a lot from previous authors um, and that I find that gets me in and I put little notes by it saying you know if I know chapter one is spring I put one by it, you know so it's often very obvious what it is but it might be migration it might be folklore whatever um, so I put a note by it and then I type it up and then when I write the book or write that chapter I look at all the spring references and think oh that would go there that would go there and start writing and then think oh i need there's that quote from gilbert white i could use that there whatever and then of course when i've drafted the chapter i then go back and look through this 20 page document maybe and then go um oh i've left that one out or oh, no that one that was not relevant anymore it's too similar to that one you know but i always keep those documents and i, I use the crossing out facility on word which makes it much easier so you can always rescue them. if you think no i'm sure there was a quote that i didn't use but i could do and you can find it again because it's it's still in that document so you don't you know don't delete those and don't don't use those as the as your document for writing because then you'll delete them and then you'll think shit there was something brilliant about swallows migrating but i can't find it anymore you know um so i do that when i did and of course i use the internet and i, I print off stuff or i collect links and put links in as well on pages um when i did bird in the bush almost pre-internet days i went to libraries and did all that and i i spent years on that book and i had pages and pages of quotes and stuff um but it's got much easier with the internet but i still i use the books first because that sort of gets me in the right mood um but it, it sort of depends on and when i'm writing you know at the moment i'm just starting this book on the swan and i'm not writing it yet so every time i read something on the swan often on twitter loads of people on twitter are obsessed with swans I just print it out so I've got it um, or I cut and paste it into a document you know uh, and that I'm now hyper aware of swans so if I see a story about swans I would have ignored I would have noticed it but now I keep it you know so it's it's that that's where it's helpful it's this sort of iterative process of working out what's in the book and then finding stuff that then changes what's in the book if that makes sense Okay, well, thanks for that question, Claire. We've come sort of near to the hour um, in terms of uh, having a chat. Stick around because once we officially close this, um, this episode, we're going to have a little um, after show party and you can ask some more questions. I'm well, sure. I'm talking, then. You can. You can let your hair down a bit and maybe we can even get into a bit of spring watch as well. Lovely. Um, yeah. So, Stephen, what um, may I ask you is your favourite bird? that's a really good question and i write about this in the swallow book because as you know i was brought up in the suburbs and i lived in london and it was always the swift it had to be the swift because when i lived in finsbury park with a young family in the late 80s and i was hardly going birding at all and hardly noticing spring and then one day in early may i'd hear the screaming and it would be a nice evening and suddenly oh my god spring's here and to me when i was at urban dweller swallows were totally irrelevant i might not see a swallow till june because you know if i was not going birding much which i wasn't in my late 20s so swallows were like oh yeah i know about them and it was bill he said to me once he said it's my, we were filming them at rutland at bird fair 
in the late 90s and he said it's my favorite bird because they're so amazing i was like all oh, right yeah fine now it's the swallow you know i've ditched the swift it's like i feel terrible it's like you know i feel i'm unfaithful to swifts but i am having written the book about the swallow it is without question the most extraordinary bird and i know i know ring oozles yours and i like you know I'd love ring users if I could only see the bloody things. But <laughs> should I tell you something? I meant to ring you, David. I meant to tell you. Just before lockdown, in the middle of March, Suzanne went on a walk with the dog round that circuit. And she came back. She said she didn't have binoculars. She said, I saw these two funny birds. I said, what were they like? She said, well, they were, said, well, they must have been blackbirds. She said, but they're white on them. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, it's middle of March. It's a blustery day. Of course they were bloody ring oozles, you know. And I showed her a picture. And she went, yeah, that's it. <laughs> No, so I thought of David, I thought, and I've never seen ring oozles even in Somerset. Oh. You know, I've seen them elsewhere, but I've never seen them in Somerset. So, anyway. <laughs> and have you a favourite mammal at all? Uh, I love cheetahs, globally. Um, in Britain, yeah, the hair. When I wrote Wild Hairs and Hummingbirds, again, moving to Somerset, hair, I became obsessed by hares. I love hares. So extraordinary, twice as fast as Usain Bolt, you know all that mythology, beautiful animals, and not many around here. I still see the occasional one. Yeah. yeah. What's your favourite mammal? Puma. That's a pretty good one, yeah. And in fact, it's my favourite animal, my favourite organism. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, if you could be anywhere on this planet, on this planet even, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be right now? You know what? I wrote about this recently, and it's very relevant. Someone said, you're very lucky, you've travelled all over the place. I said, yeah, but here, where I live, in Somerset, if I had to be in one place forever, and ironically I have been for the last two months, it would be here. And I, I really genuinely mean that. If I could be dropped anywhere and spend a lovely fortnight there, it would be the Okavango Delta in Botswana, which I've been to. And if it was somewhere I'd never been, it would be the Pantanal or Costa Rica, probably the Pantanal, I think. Yeah. Or maybe Kakadu. Oh, oh, nice. I love wetlands. Bet you've been to both of those, haven't you? I've been to Kakadu. Yeah, I knew you'd been to Kakadu. So, um, Zoomers, just to let you know that uh, this particular series, uh, I suppose, closes on Sunday uh, with Tim Appleton, the godfather of all bird fairs. So he's going to be here on Sunday at 7 o'clock BST, talking about all the things that excite him. So please join us for that. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much. It's been a, an amazing uh, hour and a bit spent with you talking about writing, nature writing, and also learning about your background. Um, fascinating, and I hope that everyone else has enjoyed it. So at this point, I want to say thank you. Well, may I say thank you back? It's always an absolute pleasure. Thank you to everyone who's, who's joined in. And, and you know, David, you and I go back a long way and we will go forward a long way. And um, I look forward to seeing you here in Somerset or in Estremadura or both very soon. Well, that would be, be a given. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>